Perfect. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about, thanks, whoever said that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about zero downtime deploys and how to make them easy. Uh, so real quick, I'm Matt Duncan. Uh, I work on the Rails team at Yammer. Uh, I also have a huge confession to make, which is that this is not really a simple problem at all, and there's really not a super easy way to do this. Uh, but it turns out if you say there is, uh, people will come to your talk. Um, so really, I'm just going to like depress the hell out of everyone and uh, show you the horrible workarounds, and then hopefully we can all kind of figure out a better solution. So there is no silver bullet. Sorry. Um, also, this is like a really broad topic, so I'm going to kind of focus on anything from your framework down. Uh, so I'm going to ignore web servers. I'm going to ignore your network stack. Anything beyond that, uh, I'll assume that you know how to deploy those uh, without downtime. You may or may not. Um, also, this isn't just a problem with Rails. Uh, I'm going to be kind of talking specifically about Rails, uh, just because it's probably most familiar to everyone, um, and in addition, Active Record. But it's really a problem with uh, pretty much any framework. Um, so yeah, uh, three topics uh, in general, which is how to do database migrations, uh, how to make changes to your database while not taking your site down, um, how to make changes to your async workers, um, stuff running in the background, uh, how to make changes to the way you queue things up, um, and also how to handle external services. So basically anything other than your database that is uh, used by your application. So first let's start with the database. Uh, it's kind of probably the most familiar to everyone. Um, and we're going to walk through a simple example. Um, let's say we have this awesome site. It has tons of users, and we've decided that we want to be able to make users administrators. Uh, we want some of our users to see different features than others. Um, so that's easy, right? We'll just make a new migration. We'll add a admin column to the table. Uh, it'll default to false, obviously, because we don't want everyone to be an administrator. And we will make it not null, because being null doesn't really make sense in this case. So uh, we'll push that code out. We will run our migration. And we're going to notice a couple of things immediately. One is that that migration is taking a really long time to run. Uh, that's bad. Also, uh, if we have really good monitoring, we're going to notice something else, which is that our site is actually down now. Um, so what's, what's going on? What's happening? Um, well, all of our web processes are just hung right now. Uh, they are stuck. So let's hop over to the database. Uh, this is how you do it in Postgres. There's similar ways to do it in basically any database you're using. Um, but this basically will check to see what has granted locks on tables, uh, granted exclusive locks. So any lock which will not allow reads or writes. Now, obviously, uh, our migration is actually still running because it's just taking forever. And we're going to see that the, uh, the uh, table change that we were making is the command that has the user's table locked. So why did that happen? Well, migrations are transactional. Um, in this case, we're actually doing two things, even though it looked like we were only doing one. Um, we're doing one thing which is really fast and really easy, and we're doing one thing which is not as easy, necessarily, um, all in that one command. So what the database actually needs to do is it needs to add the new column. That's easy. That's fast. Uh, if it's not, you should find a new database, probably. Um, the other thing is it needs to go through every single row in the database and update it. Uh, because we said it can't be null, here's the default. So it needs to go through and write that default value in every single row. Um, so the larger your table, the longer it's going to take. Um, now. How do, we, how do we get around this? Well, you could probably just do it at off-peak times, right? Uh, let's wait until we have less users on the site. Uh, so we'll do it like Friday night, late. Um, your traffic graph, if you have a reasonably popular site, though, probably looks a little bit like this. Uh, that big peak in the center is probably weekday traffic. Those dips are weekend traffic. Uh, if you have a different type of site, it may be reversed, where you get more traffic on the weekends. In any case, notice how that valley doesn't quite touch zero there. Uh, it gets lower, for sure, but it never actually touches zero. Uh, so anytime you do this, you're going to affect real users. 
Um, so there's a trade-off involved here, right? Like, we can do it uh, while people are, while not as many people are using our site, but we're still going to affect them. That may be okay, because it was really easy to write that simple migration and run it. Um, the other thing we can do is just get a faster database, right? Throw some money at the problem. That's, that's always a simple solution. Uh, that'll help, right? Um, that means we can actually do more of those updates uh, during that transaction before users start to actually notice. Eventually, though, you're going to be working with tables that are hundreds of millions or billions of records, and just throwing money at the problem is not really feasible. Uh, eventually, you have to start throwing money at people who need to come in and do weird things, and it's, yeah, weird things happen. Um, so let's walk through how we could actually do this uh, without throwing money at the problem. We'll just throw a little bit of time at the problem instead. Uh, so in this case, we'll do almost the exact same thing in our migration. Uh, we're going to make one simple change, which is we're going to allow null values. So this lets us bypass that entire hard part of the uh, table change and just do the fast part, which is adding that new column. So right now, every single record in that uh, table is going to be null. That's fine. We're not using it yet. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is write a quick task that will do the hard part for us. So the reason we're doing this is so that we can uh, basically use some very small locks while we're uh, doing the updates. So in this case, we're just going to update every single record, uh, which has a null value for the admin, and just change it to false. Um, and this can run behind the scenes. You can let it run for as long as it takes. It doesn't matter. It's not going to cause any significant load on your database. Uh, you're not going to even notice it's running, probably, uh, unless you have a really crappy database, in which case, throw a little money at the problem. Um, so we'll push that code out. We'll run our migration. Uh, this time, we'll notice something awesome, which is that it ran really, really fast. That's good. Uh, then we'll go ahead and kick off our task. You can run that behind the scenes. Um, you can start it up in a screen session on one of your servers and just let it run. Um, you can also get more creative with it. Uh, for example, at Yammer, we actually have some tools which let us uh, parallelize these types of things so that we can run multiple at the same time really easily um, and really simply. Uh, so once that's done, we can actually go back and change our table back to uh, having that non-null constraint. So this time, all we need to do, uh, or all the database needs to do, is just verify. It needs to do basically a quick table scan to make sure that there aren't any null values. Uh, if there are, it'll update them to the default. If there aren't, it's done, basically. Um, so it's super quick. Uh, it's basically as fast as your database can do a sequential scan. So again, we'll push that code up. We'll run our migration. And awesome. Site's still up. Also, wow, that was a lot of work, right? Uh, turns out this is actually just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but like I said, uh, this talk is all about trade-offs. Um, in a lot of cases, it's going to be worth the effort to do all of that work because it will keep your site up. In a lot of other cases, it's not going to be because, as you can see, it was a huge pain in the ass. Um, so yeah, uh, migrations are also not the only place that can cause these issues. Uh, this is actually apparently the iceberg that is thought to have sunk the Titanic. Uh, very innocent, yet uh, does big damage. Um, so yeah. Be careful. Um, so, so let's kind of walk through the rest of the stuff that can happen inside the database. Um, as we were just talking about, long database locks are a big problem. Um, they can happen in, these are the two biggest cases where they'll happen, uh, when you are adding non-null constraints with default values to a table. Um, also, when you're adding indexes. Uh, indexes need to lock the table in most cases. Uh, if you're using Postgres, create the index concurrently. Uh, it'll run behind the scenes, and then it'll just switch into being used. If you're using MySQL, just switch to Postgres. <laughs> uh, or there are tools that you can use, but they're probably harder to use than switching to Postgres. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, the other case is out of sync schema. So, this is actually an interesting one because uh, what happens is your application thinks that you have one schema, and your database knows that you have another schema. 
Um, so how many of you have ever seen an error like this before? Anyone? No one? Thank you. A lot of you, actually. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, so what happens here? Well, we have removed a column from our database, but our application is still doing this. It's still sending it along. Uh, so why is that happening? Well, when Active Record loads a model, uh, it asks the database for your schema, right? Um, that's why you don't have to specify the schema inside of every model that you write. Uh, you know, don't repeat yourself, right? Um, the problem with that is uh, if the schema changes, Active Record doesn't actually go through and update them. It would have to pull or something, and that's just kind of painful. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's one problem. Um, here's, here's kind of the most common cases. Uh, renaming, renaming columns, renaming tables. Uh, try to avoid renaming tables. It's probably not worth the effort. Um, and removing columns. Removing columns is uh, obviously the most common one. Um, you have a column that you don't really need anymore. You don't want to leave it around because then it just stays forever, basically. Um, so let's walk through the process of getting rid of that column without, again, taking the site down. Uh, so three steps. Uh, we're obviously going to start off initially writing to that column. Uh, so next step is to stop writing to the column. Uh, how do we do that? Well, first thing we need to do is tell the database that it's cool if we don't write to the column. So tell the database that it can have null values in the column. Uh, the next thing we need to do is actually tell Active Record to ignore that column. Uh, so it's relatively simple, um, which is we just override the, or define the uh, columns method here, and just ignore the column that we're getting rid of. So when Active Record loads the schema for that table, uh, it's going to just skip that column. And it's as if, as if it never actually existed. Um, and this is all before we run our migration. So now we want to remove the admin column. We will remove the admin column. Um, oh yeah, and then we also need to go back and clean up all of the stuff that we just added to our user's model. Um, so all of all of this code here, uh, we can actually just get rid of because we don't need it anymore. Uh, oh yeah, uh, your Mongo and Couch and Lotus Notes won't solve these problems either. Um, the, they will like let you think about data and schemas in different ways, um, and that may potentially be useful, actually. Um, but they're definitely not going to solve these problems. Uh, I didn't have enough time to go into um, the same problems with those, uh, but. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the lessons transfer. All right, so moving right along. Uh, background workers, uh, stuff that runs behind the scenes, stuff that you dump into a queue and then have jobs, then you have workers pick up and work. Um, these are actually fairly simple, uh, if you just keep one thing in mind. Queues are not going to be empty. Um, whenever you deploy code, whenever you deploy your workers, uh, the queues are going to have stuff in them. Uh, just make that assumption. There are cases where they probably won't, uh, and you could purge them if you really wanted to, but that's probably a bad idea. So just make the assumption that they won't be empty and that there will be jobs in there from the previous code. So uh, if you're changing the format of your messages, uh, so you're adding a new parameter, make sure you handle the case where that parameter doesn't exist um, and, the param and the case where the parameter does exist. Once all of those messages have flowed through and you know it's clear, uh, you can then stop handling uh, that previous case. Um, again, if you're getting rid of uh, workers, so you have something that you don't really need anymore, you'll probably just need to go purge the queue or leave one of the workers around to kind of finish off running those processes. All right, so, so those, were the, those were the easy cases. Uh, let's move on to the more interesting one, which is external services. Um, and I'm going to talk about services inside of your company. But first, I'm going to get some water. Um, so I'm going to talk about services inside your company uh, primarily because it's easier to rationalize about them. Um, you control their entire life cycle. <clears throat> so uh, first thing, version them. Um, it doesn't really matter how you do it. Uh, you can use URLs. You can use headers. You can use whatever weird format you want. Uh, just make sure they're versioned. 
Um, so let's, let's walk through like a ideal world scenario and then let's shoot holes in it. Uh, so the ideal world scenario is you have an application, it's using the first version of your API, uh, you deploy a new version and you start writing to it. You don't read from it yet, but you start writing to it. Uh, so the reason you would do that is so that you can actually just both, you can do a lot of things actually. Um, you can start doing validations on the data uh, to make sure that your new version is actually doing what you expect it to be doing and that the writes match what the first version was doing. Uh, you can also make sure it can handle your production load. Um, and you can do any backfilling of data into that version if you need to. Uh, let's say they may be potentially running on different uh, data sources. So then eventually you can switch your uh, write, or your reads, excuse me, um, to your new version and you can continue writing to your first version if you want to or not. Uh, one of the nice things, nice things about continuing to write to that version is that you could always fall back to it if something goes catastrophically wrong. Um, so it's kind of a little safety net. Uh, but eventually, obviously, you'll move off of it. So uh, one thing that you should have uh, in mind, uh, one thing that is super useful is the ability to uh, switch these things around, uh, to switch them on and off. Uh, the reason for that is when you're deploying, um, things are actually gonna look a little more like this. Uh, you're gonna have some servers that are, uh, have old code still running. Um, this is mid-deploy. You're gonna have old ser er, servers that still have old code running, uh, which are reading from your first version, and some servers which have the new code deployed, which are reading from your second version. Um, so having a switch in place that lets you more atomically uh, make that transition is really important. Um, Oh yeah, and don't forget to deploy your services in the exact same way that we've been deploying everything else because the same issues apply. Um, I've, I've been talking a lot about uh, your kind of main core application uh, and how it interacts with uh, the database and other services, but obviously this like flows all the way down into your services and their data sources and then their services and their data sources and on and on. Um, so, yeah, uh, what, what happens if you can't? Um, well, you know, uh, give yourself a way to turn services off. Um, the ability to just flip the switch on a service, uh, so let's say, for example, your search. Um, the ability to just remove that search bar um, for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes while you're deploying that new version, you can actually just take that thing out of production uh, do things nicely, uh, do things quickly, not have to do that whole migration dance that we just saw, um, and then just flip it back on again. And users may notice, they may not, um, but your site isn't gonna be down, and your users aren't gonna see errors, they're just not gonna see the full features that they might have before. So, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, what we can learn from this. Um, hopefully not everyone is super depressed yet. Um, anything can go wrong. Uh, there are like so many ways that this can go wrong. Um, I skipped a lot of them. Um, so for, for example, uh, you know, you roll out a new validation for users. Um, I have loaded the sign up form, enter in some data, you deploy the site, and then I hit submit. Oh, all of the valid data that I just submitted is now invalid because the logic on that is totally changed. Uh, so I see errors and I get really annoyed and I never sign up. Um, not everything is worth the effort though. Uh, cases like that are rarely worth the effort in handling. Uh, sometimes they are. Uh, maybe sign up is a case where it is worth the effort. Uh, I would argue that it's probably not worth the effort to handle um, the forms case uh, in most cases. Um, also, make your deploys simple and fast. Uh, if you don't have a push button deploy, you should do that. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like to deploy stuff at Yammer. Uh, you literally pick what you want to deploy, where you want to deploy it, and just hit deploy. Um, and to fit into the last talk, we have metrics. Uh, so we can actually see how many times things get deployed. Um, and the cool thing is, like, 
the easier something is to deploy, the more likely you are to deploy it, right? Um, the other thing you should do is separate your migrations from your deploys. Uh, you should think of them as totally separate things. Uh, deploying migrations are basically database deploys. Uh, deploying your application is an application deploy. Uh, you probably won't be deploying those at the same time. You probably shouldn't be deploying those at the same time. Um, so, I'm gonna get some more water. It's a very dry city. Um, <clears throat> so, so the way we used to deploy Yammer uh, when I first started, uh, and you can tell the Yammer employees in the room because they will start laughing as I tell the story, uh, was that we all like crammed into this room and it was really hot and really sweaty and we would drink because we were really afraid that we were gonna take the site down uh, and we would run the migrations and then we'd play a lot of really loud music and it looked a little like this and it was really terrible. Um, and we would basically frantically run the migrations and then deploy the site as quickly as we could because we knew the site was probably down uh, because of all the things that we just talked about. Um, and we probably all lost a few years off of our life due to stress. Um, yeah. Also, roll out your services gradually. Um, one of the things we do whenever we uh, roll out a new service at Yammer is that we roll out services really slowly. Um, we'll put maybe 5% of our traffic onto them and then kind of bump that up to 10%. And then if that looks good, maybe 20%, maybe 50%. Um, this gives us the advantage of kind of forcing us to think of the graceful uh, scenario when we need to degrade. Um, and it gives us the ability to turn things off if we need to. Um, so this, this is an example that I found. Uh, we, we have our own internal tool, but this one looked pretty awesome. Uh, it has exactly what you need uh, in a tool like this, uh, which is that you can roll it out to a certain percentage of users or uh, of requests or whatever. Um, you can pick groups. So for example, roll out services to uh, inside your site first. Um, or excuse me, inside of your company, uh, so that you can dog food those services before they hit production. Uh, especially make sure your CEO has access to these because he will be the most likely to complain about them if things go wrong and things will get fixed much quicker uh, if he is the one seeing them. Um, but you can also add in specific users uh, if you wanna give access to a few users, uh, say they're beta users or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the question slide slightly differently than most people, uh, which is, I'm gonna ask you guys some questions, uh, which is like, how do we make this easier? Uh, this is really annoying to have to do all that kind of weird stuff. Um, how, how could we build like databases that make this easier? How can we build frameworks that make this easier? Uh, yeah, um, I can answer some questions, maybe. <laughs> yes. Is a mic. Have you looked at uh, Chonko, which is written by Cookpad, to do rolling out features to parts of users? To uh, no. Uh, explain a little bit more about it. Um, Chonko is a, allows you to roll out a, a feature to a certain set of users or a certain percentage of users, and it's all baked into Rails and provides a, a framework to do part of it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that we we have our own internal tool set, uh, but yeah, that that is like exactly the type of tool that uh, I would recommend using, um, which is the ability to roll out to both certain percentage users and also pick users that can get into that rollout group. Um, it's always nice to be able to force users into a group, um, both seeing something and not seeing something. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I recently heard of a technique I thought was rather interesting, which was if you're going to be modifying a table and uh, upgrading the code to the table, um, for almost, I think, zero downtime, you just uh, cause a copy of the table to go with the new schema element in it. And meanwhile, your old code is still working on the old table 
then you, when that's done, you then deploy code that talks to the new table and then uh, a final little task to bring up anything that's in the delta between the old and the new table and then you're, you're kind of off and running and then when you're confident, you can drop the old table. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting strategy. One of the, I guess, one of the downsides would be that you have that like delta of data between those. Um, but if that's something that you can live with, yeah, that's absolutely a great way to uh, handle that, um, and it totally avoids the uh, annoyingness of like all of those steps. Um, yeah. Anyone else? I saw. I'm uh, interested how you manage the complexity of like sort of the, the multi-step migration deploy that you talked about at the beginning while you're striving for like simple push button deploys. Yeah. It seems uh, to me like that first part has to be a manual process, right? Yes, it is a manual process. Uh, poorly is the answer to that. Um, the, so so when, we, when we look at uh, the push button process, that's all application uh, level push button process. The database stuff is not quite as awesome. Um, we're looking to make it better. Uh, our, our site stuff used to be not push button as well. Uh, it's become push button. Um, yeah, uh, poorly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have a great solution for that. Uh, the, way, the way that we normally do it now is we'll kind of run one migration at a time uh, manually. Usually there aren't a ton that that becomes unreasonable. Um, and it also gives us a way to kind of vet things that are shipping. Uh, to answer the question of one way we can actually do it easier is uh, don't remove your tests until after your code is out. Um, make sure that all of your old tests are passing yeah. so that you don't run into that, that weird migration window. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hi, I'm just curious how you enforce this migration policy among all the engineers. It, seem, it would seem like a complicated thing. Because, yeah, if there are multiple steps, you know, a new guy is coming in, he doesn't remember that step. Everything yeah, breaks uh, poorly. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's kind of a human management problem, right? Like, it's a, it's something that, uh, all of the engineers basically just kind of need to be on the same page about. Um, uh, I would say trust your engineers. Uh, you should be able to trust your engineers. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I would still separate that into the, like, make your database deploys separate, make your database schema changes separate from your application deploys. Um, for example, like, creating a table is perfectly safe. Like, you could do that at any time. Um, it's not going to affect your application at all, unless you're doing something really weird. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard. <laughs> uh, it's, it's basically a human problem, uh, a kind of like collective understanding problem, um, just kind of getting everyone on the same page. Uh, having, having people kind of like ultimately responsible for uh, the deployment of those migrations uh, does help um, because there are usually other things that we need to look at uh, when we're, for example, adding or removing stuff. Uh, for example, our analytics team may be using uh, some of that data and they need to know to upgrade their scripts uh, to get rid of those columns as well. Um, Etsy's done some talk on using code to do defaults versus using the database to do, do defaults, like uh, auto-incrementing, and um, what, have you yep. guys experimented with that to find, so you're not locking your tables when you're doing yeah. the value? Yeah, uh, we have not really. Um, I, I would be interested to try it though. Uh, the, the database constraints are nice, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we arguably don't get a lot of benefit out of them uh, just because we have a single application that's writing and reading from the database. Uh, if you have more than one application, 
it's kind of less useful to have those uh, defaults in each application. Uh, or I should say it's more useful to have them in a centralized place. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting idea that we haven't really explored very much. Um, yeah. Uh, let's do one more. Basically, what we're describing here are uh, transitions between legal states of the production environment. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so are you familiar with anyone who is exploring um, uh, describing those transitions at a higher level where we can say uh, that I'm, I'm starting at a state that has these known constraints on it and I want to apply this set of forward transforms, it, kind of like we do with migrations, but at a higher level? Yeah, at a, at a more like operational level, you're saying? Um, vaguely, yes. Uh, I, I don't know of any, I'm not aware of any uh, good way to do that or kind of simple way to do that. Uh, arguably, this wasn't very simple either, um, but it is kind of more familiar to people. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely be interested in learning about them though. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Thank you, everyone.